Hello, good morning. My name is Lily Peng. Uh, I am a doctor by training. Uh, and at Google, I work uh, with a team of scientists, researchers, uh, doctors on applying deep learning to uh, medical data. So thank you for having me this morning. Um, first off, I'm gonna start with a, a few definitions uh, to kind of frame the talk. So um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, these are all very common terms now. Um, and they all mean slightly different things, but are somehow used interchangeably. So what do we mean um, by, by artificial intelligence? Well, that's actually a pretty broad term, and it's the science of making things um, smarter, right? systems smarter. And one particular way of pursuing this goal is called machine learning. And machine learning is um, a discipline where we actually teach systems to learn to be smarter rather than explicitly programming any of the rules. And then deep learning is a particular type of machine learning that has become very popular in the last few years. Um, and I'll tell you why in the next slide or so. So what is deep learning? The roots of this technology isn't really new. In fact, it's based upon um, something called artificial neural networks that has been around since the 1960s. What's different in the last few years is that the compute power we have has increased a thousandfold, and the data that we have, the size of the data that we have, have increased quite a bit. And because of this, deep learning has proven itself to be quite accurate uh, because it does much better at larger data set sizes and larger neural network sizes. The other thing that is really fantastic about deep learning is that it's very good at learning features from raw data, which means that you do not have to program uh, the system uh, with rules. So why, I'm, I'm a doctor, uh, why am I talking about deep learning and why is this actually quite important to medicine? Well, machine learning and deep learning is really good for problems where there's a lack of expertise but lots of data to look through. And that's exactly the problem we have in medicine. Uh, in fact, uh, in many screening programs, imaging programs, routine imaging programs, the amount of data that doctors have to look through has increased many, many folds. Um, and so machine learning is really good at making sense of all of this data and sifting through it and picking out the relevant pieces of information for doctors. The other thing that uh, makes deep learning particularly useful in medicine is that the expertise, um, the number of doctors is quite limited. So in the chart here um, that's uh, on the left there, you could see that there is a global shortage of physicians. Um, this, is, this describes radiologists, doctors who actually look at images um, as their main uh, work. And you can see that in most countries, there's a shortage of doctors, but, uh, of radiologists, but this is true for all forms of doctors. So one of the big screening programs, one of the big problems that we've um, come against in medicine is diabetes. And diabetes causes complications all across the body. Uh, one of the most uh, concerning ones is in the eye and it causes a disease called diabetic retinopathy. And it's actually the fastest growing cause of preventable blindness in the world now because of diabetes. And so there's 415 million people uh, with diabetes in the world, and all of them should be screened once a year with, for this disease. So this is done by taking a picture of the back of the eye, and then you get a picture like this. Uh, it, you use a pretty special camera there to get, get that picture. And that picture is then graded by ophthalmologists or eye care doctors on a scale from one to five. So from no disease to um, very severe disease, which is called proliferative disease. And doctors look for little things like bleeding in the eye. So uh, you can see right now it's pointing out this, you know, these red splotches, which are hemorrhages. So unfortunately, in many parts of the world, there simply aren't enough doctors to do this, do this task. Uh, in fact, in India, where we actually have a lot of our partnerships, there's a shortage of 127,000 eye doctors. And as a result, about half the patients actually suffer some form of vision loss before they're presenting to care. And as I 
um, alluded to, this disease is completely preventable. So having half the population suffer some sort of form of vision loss is just unacceptable. So we partnered with some providers uh, in India to help uh, train a neural net for this task. Um, and so we got about 130,000 images, so these fundus photos. We hired 54 board-certified U.S. ophthalmologists. We built a labeling tool and had them uh, render about 880,000 diagnoses, uh, relabeling these images. And then we took this data set and we put it into a relatively well-known convolutional neural network called Inception. So this is the architecture of, in the middle of the neural network, and it is, um, this, this network is actually very commonly used. It's used in photos, it's used in many classification tasks. We simply retrained it to look at fundus images. So how well does it do? Well, uh, in 2016, in December 2016, we published a paper in um, the Journal of the American Medical Association showing that the algorithm, which is in the blue line here, is, was on par with generalists. So actually in 2016, that line was lower. And then since then, we've made some improvements to the algorithm and we published a paper in the, uh, early this year that uh, showed that it was on par with specialists, so the people who treat diabetic retinopathy the most. So that's actually very promising um, uh, in, in terms of uh, clinical validation. But we also worked with the hospitals in, uh, in India, so Arvind and Shankar are our main partners there on, on pilots. And three months in, uh, the Arvind Hospital is observing uh, pretty good results uh, with our pilot deployment, and we're hoping to scale with them. So uh, one of the things that uh, we've um, heard as we were training these models is that even though they're highly accurate, they seem to be a little bit of a black box. It's hard to explain how they're making their predictions. Well, you know, um, we've actually made some really good progress since then, uh, such that we can actually try to explain how the neural network is making some of their predictions. So this is an example in the consumer space of a consumer photos where we use something called show and tell so that to get the neural network to highlight the pixels in the image that is most relevant for the prediction. So uh, here you, on the top, you have a picture of a Pomeranian and an Afghan hound, and below you see a heat map of where the pixels are that's most relevant for that prediction. So for example, the Pomeranian, there's something about the face of the Pomeranian that makes it characteristic of the Pomeranian. So we simply took the same technique and we used it on the fundus images. So this is a picture of somebody with mild disease. I can tell it's mild disease because I can't tell what's wrong with it. It looks perfectly normal to me. But the network can pick out the little microaneurysms that's present in this image in the green part here. So I'm gonna, there's, it's there. Here's an example of a patient with moderate disease. It's a little worse because you can see actually darker spots, dark, darker uh, splotches that are hemorrhages, larger hemorrhages. Uh, and the neural network picks those out too. What's really interesting about this example is the neural network actually also ignores two artifacts. There's an artifact in the middle of the image where, the, where there's a reflection and there's a dust spot on the lens. Uh, and, and the neural net actually ignores both of them. So that's pretty exciting. Okay, so what's next? Well, there's a lot more to do on the path to, to actually getting this into the hands of doctors and in, 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 in helping patients. So first is what I've alluded to already, which is clinical trials and regulatory. So working with healthcare providers at Aravind, at Shankara, uh, with uh, hospitals in Thailand and in the US on actually validating these models uh, in the clinic. And then, of course, working with the regulatory agencies uh, to get the CE mark or FDA approval. In addition, taking pictures is actually uh, quite difficult sometimes in, in, in the screening process. It requires a special camera, a special operator. So we teamed up with hardware providers, uh, Nikon and Optos specifically, through our um, uh, sister alphabet company, Verily, and we're all working together to make uh, cheaper hardware such that taking a picture isn't a barrier to screening either. So 
I've talked a little bit about a diagnose uh, application in screening, and so now I'm going to talk um, a, a bit about a, an application in diagnosis, where there's, again, a lot of information for a doctor to sift through um, where a machine can potentially help. And in this particular example, we're looking at uh, detecting breast cancer metastases in lymph nodes. So when a patient is diagnosed with breast cancer, one of the things that doctors do is look at what we call lymph nodes, which are little nodes next to the breast uh, cancer that uh, the cancer tends to spread to first. So this task is actually not a very uh, easy task to do. Uh, because you actually, so this is a picture, uh, a very zoomed out picture of what one of these lymph nodes look like. And each of these pictures is about 10 gigapixels. So it's about 1,000 consumer photos. And you're looking for very, very subtle findings, like a, a, a few clusters of cells sometimes. And so this is quite a difficult task. And in fact, about one in four, one in four lymph node biopsies, when they actually go back to review, um, has a change in nodal status, which means that the diagnose change it, diagnosis changed upon further review. Um, and, and why is that? Well, because it's, it's a needle in a haystack. Um, and with unlimited time, pathologists find about 73% of the cancers, uh, of the lesions on a map like this, with zero false positives. Um, but with time pressure, that, that sensitivity, that number goes down. We trained a model that found about 95% of the cancer lesions with about eight false positives per slide. And, I, and our hypothesis is that the ideal system would combine both, uh, both the pathologist and the machine learning model to increase both sensitivity without uh, sacrificing the false positive rate. So what's next? Well, we're going to actually study this in, uh, with the doctor and the machine learning system together in reader studies. And then also, this is clearly very applicable to other tissues. And we've actually had some success in the, uh, in the prostate cancer space. Okay. All right. So finally, the two examples I've talked about really highlight um, the power of machine learning to help doctors do tasks that they kind of already know how to do. I mean, they actually know already know how to do, but we're actually helping them to be a little more accurate. But what about predicting things that doctors can't currently predict, or potentially using the system for um, uh, new discoveries? Well, on the picture on the left here is from a paper that uh, we published recently, and we actually use the neural network to predict cardiovascular risk factors as well as cardiovascular disease on the fundus image alone, so from the imaging of the eye. Uh, and in fact, if you can see the really small text there, it does a pretty good job in predicting some of these cardiovascular risk factors like age and self-reported uh, sex and blood pressure. But in fact, it also does a pretty good job in predicting your five-year risk of a heart attack or stroke. And so that, this is what we call in medicine a MACE, a major adverse cardiovascular event. Um, and that AUC is 0.7 which means that if we gave, you a, gave, gave the system a picture of a patient who had a heart attack within five years and a patient who did not have a heart attack in five years, the model would be right about 70% of the time. Uh, for humans, that's, it's about 50% of the time. It's, it's a little random. We, we don't really know how to do this task very accurately. So um, this is actually quite promising. Now, I want to emphasize this is very preliminary because we only had a few hundred training examples. But it is a demonstration of how uh, deep learning can actually be used to find new knowledge uh, and information that we didn't, we didn't know existed. All right, so uh, from these examples, um, I hope uh, I've kind of illustrated how deep learning and machine learning can be used to increase the availability and accuracy of care. Uh, it's actually really exciting, I think, for us um, as a research group within Google to not only do these, um, some of this research ourselves, but also see the amount of research that's been out there. And I, I would encourage you guys to look at all the other research that is being produced by um, multiple, of other, uh, multiple of other groups using TensorFlow and deep learning to actually really further medicine. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Lily. Yeah, have a seat if you want to. Um, this is the time to ask your questions. I have two so far. 
Um, so one question is being, are doctors open to collaboration or do you find it difficult to gain their trust from the very beginning using those things? Ah, so I guess the question is, uh, is it from the very, very beginning or now? I think, um, I think now, so taking a step back, in general, phys doctors, a lot of, it depends on the doctors, but most doctors really care about how they can improve um, care for their patients. And so, you know, given the amount of information that every doctor is faced with every day, um, and that information's increasing, we've definitely um, seen physicians actually saying, hey, look, you know, maybe technology can actually help us, because technology has you know, given us all this data and now help us sift through it. Um, so we haven't, um, we actually have found um, very uh, wonderful collaborators uh, within the physician community, and in fact, we couldn't have done any of this without, without that support. Okay, great. And the other one is, if doctors can predict when patients will die, do you have any case studies how to work with this type of information? Ah, so it's actually interesting. Um, taking a step back, as a physician, we actually use um, calculators right now. When you actually go into a hospital, we're, it, we're, it's very common we use these uh, rule-based calculators to actually look at your risk of mortality. Um, and so we do this already uh, to understand where you need to go. So do you need to go in ICU and what kind of monitoring do you need? So we, we implicitly kind of do this, or actually explicitly do this already, um, but we just use different kinds of calculators. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, deep learning has a potential to make some of these predictions a little better. I think it is more useful to predict something like, uh, you know, risk of a heart attack or other mm -hmm. things where there's something you can do ab about it, right, prevention. So it's actually more useful to, prevent, to, to predict an event where there's an intervention in which you can then decrease the risk of that. Because sometimes giving information uh, um, about something that you can't do very much about isn't le is, is less useful. So. True, that sounds true. <laughs> One more is Aravind is an incredible partner to have on board. Can you share some details on how, to, how deep learning can help in eye disease, diseases? Ah, um, so Aravind is one of the really great partners to have because they've been scaling um, eye care, uh, cataracts to begin with, uh, in underserved populations for decades. And they've been working on the diabetic retinopathy um, problem uh, for quite some time, actually, even before we had talked to them. Um, and, and, and what had happened was they actually saw this great need, and we, we were able to help with that need. But um, that partnership really uh, happened because Arvind was already sort of doing a lot of this good work uh, in India to prevent blindness. And in some ways, all we did was, uh, you know, help a little bit there. Uh, separately, they have an amazing program already. So this is definitely, you know, their thing. And we are, we are just very glad to be a part of it. Perfect. Thank you right. so much.